Beyond the yawning mouth of the cave extends a dark passage, which is quite tall above you, but incredibly narrow, requiring you to turn to the side to be able to squeeze your way between the rock facings. No light naturally extends as far down the passage as you must travel, and your dark vision is impeded by the crooked angles of the rocks down the shaft. As you squeeze your way between the rock, a sticky cotton-like substance attaches to your armour. It clings to you in clumps, and a net of it covers the exit at the bottom of the shaft through which you must force your way. The chamber you find yourself standing inside of is much larger than the tunnel which you've just travelled down, but you can see the walls are completely encased in that white sticky cotton. You hear movement from above you. When you look up, you see a bulbous creature descending down towards you on a strand of cotton as thick as rope. The silhouette of its eight segmented legs are extended out towards you. No, no spiders. I don't want any spiders. Hello, my name is Ben Byrne, and this is how you run the most important session of your D&D campaign, Session Zero. In previous videos, I've discussed how much I personally love the immersive, tension-filled, horrific worlds of dark fantasy when I sit down to play a tabletop role-playing game like D&D 5th Edition. The moral complexity and the themes of dark fantasy stick with me long after I've finished playing the game. But that's not why everybody comes and plays role-playing games. Some people just want a power fantasy where they feel powerful within the world of the campaign that's happening. Some people just like beer and pretzels D&D where they sit down, have a laugh and socialise with their friends. And having similar expectations of what you want out of your experience when playing a tabletop RPG as everybody else sitting at the table is really important to ensuring that everybody has a good time. If you've been playing D&D for a while, you've probably heard the term Session Zero before. But if you haven't, Session Zero is basically the session that you have at the start of your D&D campaign where no actual gameplay takes place. It's just where the group sit down together, maybe get to know each other and also decide a upon the sort of experience that you want to have together. Think of it sort of as deciding what sort of board game you think the group would most enjoy playing together. Are you a group that's into a really atmospheric, thematic, tension-filled game of Twilight Imperium, or do you think the group would be more suited to something more casual, like a Codenames instead? There are no wrong answers with a Session Zero. It's just about getting everybody on the same page, learning what everybody wants out of their D&D experience to ensure that everybody gets what it is they want and that you're well matched as a group to play together. In this video, I'm going to give you a breakdown of how to run a fun and engaging Session Zero, whether you're the game master or one of the players, and I'm gonna do it in five easy to follow steps. Step one. Have a chat with the players, have a chat as a group and learn what all of you are hoping to get out of your game of D&D. Step two, have the GM introduce the campaign setting. What is the world like in which you're going to set your campaign? Step three, have the GM establish their homebrew rules, the things that they think are important to having a really good experience together. Step four, hear from the players. This is something that will be happening throughout the session zero, but having a moment to really hear what the players like and dislike about the campaign world, the homebrew rules the GM wants to use is very important. Step five, then you start your character creation. Having the context of the world in which the campaign's going to take place and knowing what the homebrew rules are, you begin making your characters together. Step one, have everybody discuss what they like about Dungeons and Dragons. This step can even take place ahead of session zero when you're messaging each other and organizing a time to sit down and play. This is basically where you discuss as a group what you like about D&D and what you're hoping to get out of the experience. Maybe you already know each other and you already know your tastes within Dungeons and Dragons, but this is a good opportunity to discuss what you as a group want out of this new campaign specifically. If you 
you've played together before in a dark fantasy campaign? Do you want to have that same experience again? Or do you want to try something lighter or a different genre of fantasy perhaps? If you're strangers and you're getting to know each other for the first time, this is a great opportunity to just ask each other questions. And you can have a formalized, this is what we like about D&D moment, but you can also just ask each other questions in the in-between moments while everybody is still arriving or ordering food. And here are some questions to have in your back pocket if you want to have some icebreakers. What made you want to try D&D? What do you expect D&D will be like? Have you watched any live play D&D games before and which one did you like? So how did you learn what D&D was? These can also be non-specific D&D questions as well, just getting to know you sort of things like what sort of fantasy shows are you into? Or who's your favourite character in the Fellowship? Do you like the end of Game of Thrones? Just these kind of like icebreaker, getting to know you sort of things that give you insight into the sort of campaign that the group wants to play. For example, if somebody was introduced to playing D&D because they were watching live plays, if they really enjoyed Dimension 20 and didn't really get into Critical Role, this gives you an idea that maybe they're not down for an emotionally impactful fantasy game and they want something light and fun where the GM says yes way more often than they say no. If everybody's answers to these questions are quite different, some people really want that light-hearted comedic campaign and some people want that dark fantasy gritty thematic campaign, this doesn't necessarily mean that the group is incompatible. It just means that the GM might have to do a bit of work to balance everybody's expectations to ensure that everybody's getting what they want out of the game. And other folks at the table might need to balance out their expectations a little bit and appreciate that this is a shared experience and it's not a game made exclusively for you as an individual, but for the group together. For example, I have players at my own home game. One of them really loves combat and the power fantasy of just monstering goblins in a fight. And other folks at my table don't like combat that much and much prefer the social aspect and the drama of the game that we play. And balancing out those two things can be a slight challenge, but it just means some sessions are more combat heavy and some sessions are more social heavy so that everybody gets what they want out of the game at some point. During this time in a session zero, it might also be a good opportunity to ask what sort of characters the players are thinking of playing because first, it's great icebreaker sort of conversation topic. And second, it also gives you an indication of the sort of experience they wanna have. It's pretty clear the experience wanted by a player who wants to play Dracarius, the ranger who must avenge their father's death and reclaim the soul stealer sword that is their family heirloom and the player that wants to play Bertle, the Aracocra bard who only sings and speaks in the style of 60s radio. Step two is to introduce the campaign setting. After everybody's gotten to know each other, this is the moment during the session zero where the GM fundamentally sells their wares to the rest of the party and tells them the world that they want to create for the campaign to occur in. The campaign world is like the GM's player character. So the players kind of have to meet the GM on some level to want to play in the campaign world the GM wants to provide. So this is where the GM sets up the campaign world for the players to couch their character within. And the first step of that is for the GM to establish the tone and the atmosphere of the campaign world. Is it going to be dark and gritty and grounded or is it going to be fun and light? Is it going to be high fantasy, dark fantasy, heroic fantasy, swords and sorcery? Is it going to be really low magic uh, where everything is really grounded and magic is rare or is it going to have magic as common as every creature being able to cast at least some sort of simple cantrip? Using known pop culture references can help give the players a really strong idea of what your campaign world is going to be like. So saying it is like Game of Thrones, or it is like the world from Arcane, like Middle Earth, the world of God of War or Horizon Zero Dawn. These are all totally fine touchstones to give the players a really clear idea of the sort of world that you are creating for them to explore. The next step is for the GM to describe the campaign world itself in a little bit more detail beyond just the themes and the atmosphere. Though they should try to still be relatively brief and keep it to three to five interesting facts about the world max. You don't want the players to have to sit through a really dense exposition drop. For example, if you were going to set your campaign in the world of Grim Hollow, you might mention the gods are dead. And so divine magic is very rare within this world. Arc Seraphs have tried to inherit the position of the gods, but they are not as powerful. And so they are barely holding things together. Humans have spread across all 
all of the five main realms of Grim Hollow and have dominated them to the detriment of many of the other races. Magic is very rare within this setting and folks are very suspicious of mages and those that are able to cast magic and there's a lot of moral ambiguity because those that are in power are not necessarily acting in the interests of those that don't have any power. Just try not to go too large all at once. The players don't need to know the history of every city of this massive continent that you've constructed. They might just need to know about what's relevant to the village, the town, the city that the campaign is starting in and what directly affects that as a starting location. Step three. Discuss homebrew rules. D&D 5th edition is a particularly flexible set of rules for a role-playing game. There's a lot of optional rules that can be included or ignored, and it's important to establish which ones are important to you as the GM for your game, or which ones are important for you as a group, rather. So, optional rules. What optional rules do you use in your campaigns? Do you allow player characters to take feats? Do you use the flanking rules during combat or not? These things are important to establish because your players might have characters in their mind that require a feat for that character to work the way the player wants it to. And if you tell them that feats don't exist after they've already made that character, that's an example of misaligned expectations. What are your personal rulings on specific rules that sometimes, maybe even frequently, get misinterpreted? For example, the conjuration spells often specify that it's actually the GM that decides specifically what sort of creature is summoned by the spell. Do you want to play it that way and have the GM decide whether it's a pack of eight wolves or eight spiders that show up? Or do you want the player, the druid, to have the power to decide specifically what animals they are able to conjure when they cast Conjure Woodland Beings? Do you use grid combat in your campaigns or do you prefer to use theatre of the mind? And what are the specific rules around like range and area of effects when using the grid? How do characters attune to magic items? Can they learn what a magic item does just from inspecting it maybe with an arcana check or are they required to use a spell like identify or spend eight hours or maybe even a day learning what a magic item does to be able to attune to it. Then let's talk about your personal preferences for the campaign as the GM. Do you like to give out magic items all the time? Are magic items common within your campaign or are magic items going to be relatively rare and maybe the party find consumables more often than another plus one sword to throw on the pile? Is there player versus player combat in your campaign? As a group, do you want to allow that to happen? Do you want the rogue to be able to thieve from their fellow party members? Or do you as a group want to decide early in the campaign that no, we are a team, we are working together and to maintain peace at the table, let's keep it that way in the game as well. How should the players use their meta knowledge at the table? Are you as a GM okay with them bringing information that they know from the outside world into the game? Or do you want them to strictly stick with what their players are meant to know within the campaign world? How strictly do you adhere to the rules? particularly with things like donning and doffing armor. Are you strict about whether characters can go to sleep with their armor on or not? Do you want the players to track things like their rations and their ammunition? Is it important to you that the archer makes sure that they have enough arrows at the start of each adventure? Do you track encumbrance? Is that something that's important to you as a GM or important to the group? Or is that something that you think you'd have more fun if you just forgot about? And of course, any house rules that the GM has that they want to bring to the table. For example, Grim Hollow has different long rest, short rest, quick rest mechanics, which I've talked about in earlier videos. And basically the crux of it is that to get a long rest, you actually need to spend three days of downtime rather than just an eight hour sleep. Do you have grievous wounds or permanent wound mechanics that the players need to be aware of? Do they gain a level of exhaustion when they hit zero HP? And they should be aware of this ahead of time so that they know what their strategy and tactics are going to be during combat to avoid that or they don't really care a healing word is good enough to get someone back in the fight and on their feet or the other way around. Of course all of the GM's preferences, all of their homebrew rules are all a negotiation with the players to ensure that everybody's going to have fun at the table. The GM should try to explain why they want to include certain preferences or house rules. For example, magic items are rare within this campaign setting because magic itself is rare and should feel dangerous and I want it to feel really special when you discover that magic item.
Step four, hear from the players. In the previous two steps we've discussed, there's been a lot of the GM talking to the players, discussing their campaign world and the homebrew rules that they like to include within their campaign. But it's important to note that this is all a negotiation to ensure that everybody at the table is going to play the sort of campaign they wanna play, both the players and the GM included. Because the GM is just another player at the table. There is no reason why the sort of campaign they wanna run is more important than the sort of campaign the players want to experience, and it's about getting everybody on the same page. On the flip side, the GM's not beholden to the players. There's no reason that the player's experience is more important than the GM's, and they should be able to run the sort of campaign they want to run as well. So it's a negotiation getting everybody on the same page. If you've gotten to this point and the players haven't had a chance to voice their opinions and their thoughts about the sort of campaign the GM has outlined, now is the time. Does everybody think that they can create a character that fits within the GM's campaign world? Or have their thoughts changed due to something that the GM has described? Can a character say, you've said that you don't like feats within this campaign, can I just take one feat at level four because the character I have in mind really hinges on being able to take this feat? Sure, you can take this feat at fourth level. Let's say everybody can take a feat at fourth level, but after fourth level, no more feats. Or the player really wants to play a tabaxi and the GM has decided described how anthropomorphic races don't exist within their campaign setting. All right, let's try sort this out. Maybe instead of being a tabaxi from a race of cat-like people, you were once human or you were born with a curse to look like a cat and your character's motivation is somewhat around trying to cure that curse. You see what I'm saying? You're sort of finding ways that the player and the GM can both be happy by negotiating out the sorts of characters that the players are gonna bring to the table within the campaign world that the GM has described. And finding ways for the player characters to feel like they're part of the GM's world I think is really important to a good experience for the players as well because they'll feel like their characters are from the world of the campaign and not these strange outsiders that don't have any sort of shared experience with the other NPCs within the campaign world. If you've gotten to this point within the campaign and the players haven't voiced their opinion about what they think about the sort of campaign that you're going to run as a GM, especially if it's a new group and people aren't yet comfortable voicing their opinions, then take the time, perhaps at this point during your session zero, to ask them questions. What sounds good to you about the game that we're going to run? What areas are you looking forward to exploring that I've described, whether it's a physical location or a specific theme that you think your character is going to really sink their teeth into? What sort of monsters do you think would exist within this campaign setting that you're really looking forward to potentially coming across? Or are you more interested in the social intrigue that I've described that exists within this campaign world? Learning these sorts of things allows you to prime yourself to create the campaign that the players want to engage with when they tell you what they're looking forward to within your campaign. Is there anything within this campaign world that concerns you? Is there anything that you don't want to experience that I've described? For example, there's an Arcanist Inquisition that hunts down all spellcasters. You want to play a spellcaster. Do you want the Arcanist Inquisition to be featured in this campaign? Or is that something you're not particularly interested in because you don't want to have to feel like your character is constantly on the run and can't use their magic? Communication is absolutely key in ensuring that everybody, the GM and the players included, are on the same page. And it's totally okay to have boundaries that you set for yourself that others at the table aren't allowed to cross. For example, a player might say, I don't want spiders in this campaign. I'm kind of arachnophobic and I would prefer if I'm not in a deep dark cave getting attacked by a giant spider descending down from me from above. Or even the GM might say, look friends, I really don't want to have to describe really violent blood and gore. I don't deal well with that. And so I would appreciate when you're describing your attacks, if you don't describe the gritty details of how you attack the NPCs that I've created. There are specific safety tools that can be used at the table to ensure that everybody's having a good time all the time and that these boundaries aren't crossed. And these are things like the X card, which you point to at the table whenever you're feeling particularly uncomfortable, or you can just say X card or veils and lines where everybody describes what they're okay with being alluded to within the campaign, which is a veil or what they hardcore don't want to have to witness within the campaign, which is a line. 
If you're a group of friends that have played with each other for years, you might feel that safety tools are less relevant to you because you know each other really well. But if you use safety tools at the table, you might be surprised at how it changes the game or what does come up during the role play that people have felt like they could talk about less in the past. For example, a safety tool that I love to implement in my campaigns is the traffic light system. Red card, yellow card, green card. The red card is basically the X card. It says, no, I'm not comfortable with what's happening in the campaign at the moment. The yellow card you point to if you're starting to feel a bit uncomfortable, if you think someone's treading somewhere that you don't wanna go. And the green card is there to indicate when you're still having fun, even if your player character is in a moment of emotional distress. You might be shouting in character at another player at the table saying, you rotten person, I feel really bad for X reason, but you point to the green card to indicate that you, the player, is still having a lot of fun playing the game. To know more about safety tools, Alex Caton wrote a really great article that goes into better detail about how to use the X card and veils and lines specifically. And she also wrote a really fantastic article about running session zeros for dark fantasy specifically. So check it out if you're interested. Step five, character creation. And this is the step that most people think of when it comes to session zeros, getting together and creating your characters as a group. And it is the most fun part of a session zero, I think. It's also what should take the longest. If you spend the first hour, hour and a half, if you're having dinner together, doing the first four steps, this part of the session zero should take probably the rest of the time, the next hour and a half to two hours. But the reason this step comes last is so that you have all of the context of your GM's campaign world and the house rules they want to use and the rulings they have around things like feats and flanking so that you can create your character with that full knowledge so that they feel part of the campaign world that your GM has created for you. These are the steps that I like to take in character creation. And I think that it's important for the players to really talk about the character they wanna play before rolling any stats at all. The way that you do this is to allow everybody to answer a couple of basic questions about who their character is, where they're from within the campaign world, what sort of background do they have? Were they once a warrior? Are they a loner? Were they a hermit who lived alone in the woods once upon a time? Try to think outside the bounds of what the classes describe. Don't describe your character in these early stages as an elven monk, a human fighter, an orcish wizard, because that constrains your character into being only what that class describes them to be. What describing your character outside of the constraints of the class allow you to do is conjure an image of your character that isn't being shaped by the stereotypes of your specific class class. So instead of saying wizard, fighter, monk, say, I am an academic who is trying to unlock the secrets of the arcane through studious study. I am a soldier in my queen's army and I've been retired for a while now, but I'm out on the road adventuring, righting the wrongs that I perceive. Or I have spent a long time on my own out in the woods, searching for spiritual enlightenment, trying to improve my body and my mind through meditation and training. Training. The difference is subtle because I'm fundamentally still describing a monk, a fighter, or a wizard, but it just allows you to create a character that feels more unique to you rather than being boxed into a specific way of being described. So once you have a basic idea of who the characters are, ask your players to establish pre-existing relationships between all the characters at the table. Now, this might not be entirely necessary, especially if you're playing one of those you all meet in a tavern sort of campaigns where everybody's strangers. But in my experience, it's much better to have at least a couple of pre-existing relationships between characters at the table. And this is because a lot of campaigns can have awkward phases where the player characters are trying to figure out why they should all stick together when the central conflict at the start of the campaign is really telling them it would be better if you all split apart. It's also a good time to establish things like whether or not you're going to be able to coexist as a party because you 
you have a paladin and you have a warlock or a rogue and the paladin smites all evil that they see before them, which means that the warlock and rogue are gonna get in trouble if they steal or speak to their patron. So establishing why these relationships work, establishing how you're not going to have inner party conflict if you don't want to have inner party conflict is a good thing to do at this stage of character creation. But it's also great to have a fully formed party before the start of the campaign. If they don't all start in a tavern, maybe they're members of a pirate crew or maybe they're members of a merchant caravan that goes around the countryside selling their wares. Maybe they're already an adventuring guild who sell their services as mercenaries and this is just their latest adventure. If they're starting at level one, maybe they're a startup. They're an adventuring guild who's just trying to get their marketing sorted out and they finally got their first quest and off they go to accomplish it. Once you have all that established, you have a basic idea of who your character is and you have some relationships established between the player characters, now we start rolling for stats and now we start putting pen to paper and writing out our characters rules and their abilities as per the character creation rules for fifth edition or whatever role playing game you happen to be playing. You can also negotiate whether you're going to double up on roles or not. If you have two people really wanting to play a bard, maybe one of them plays a warlock instead, or do you have too many martial classes and you realize the party doesn't have a healer? I personally don't think it's a problem if you've got a party of three warlocks and no no healer or a party where everybody wants to deal damage and nobody thought to play a cleric or you have a party that's all clerics and you're going around spreading the word of the good book. I think that's totally fine but you might decide as a player group it would be more fun if you have all the roles covered. You have your tank, your damage dealer and your healer or you've played in campaigns previously where it's been a disaster where everybody was a rogue and you feel like you want to buck the trend a little bit when three people at the table choose rogue. Mind you I did run a one shot with three characters that were all rogue and it was a lot of fun because we basically did a heist. This is also the perfect opportunity to help new players at the table if you're new as a group to playing D&D and the GM is experienced or one of the other players is experienced. Maybe they're able to create their character in 20 minutes, half an hour of jotting down all the choices they want to make. They can take longer if they want to, but if they find themselves with spare time, it's the perfect opportunity to go around and help others that are less experienced to create their characters for the first time. Or if everybody's new, maybe you all learn the process of character creation together. And that can be a lot of fun. You can do further character creation bonding-like activities like choosing miniatures from online, or maybe you use Hero Forge to create your character, or going onto a website like Pinterest and finding some artwork that you think really represents your character. Or maybe you decide to have a later session where you're gonna get together and paint your miniatures together. All these things can create a really strong bond between not just the player character, characters, but the players themselves and set you up to have a fantastic time playing your Dungeons and Dragons campaign. And that's how I run my session zeros. And I think they really are fundamental to having a fantastic D&D campaign experience. Even if you're running other role-playing games like Vampire Masquerade, Call of Cthulhu, dare I say The Witcher, session zeros are a great way to set up the experience that you all want to have as a table, whether you're the player or the GM. If you enjoyed this video, we have heaps more on our YouTube channel. You can like this video and subscribe to the channel. I will be back next week and every week we with more tips about how to run D&D 5e, especially in the realm of dark fantasy.